In my previous video, I talked about the new supplements that I'm taking and I shared my updated list. Well, one of the questions was also that what are the supplements that I stopped taking and what are the red flag supplements? So in this video and in this q and I'm going to cover this topic and many other questions. All right, the first question, you shared the new supplements you're taking. What are the supplements you stopped taking? So the first supplement that I want to talk about is spermidine. This supplement has become quite popular over the past few years and it's essentially a polyamine that is thought to have benefits for autophagy regulation and other aspects of aging and longevity. Now, first of all, there's no human trials on spermidine supplementation that it's going to have any like longevity benefits. And the only hint or the only reason why people think that spermidine supplements might have longevity benefits has to do with the studies on dietary spermidine intake. So the spermidine that you get from uh, foods, that has been uh, found to be associated with reduced mortality, reduced hypertension, reduced risk of other diseases uh, quite uh, often in uh, previous studies, but uh, there's no studies indicating that uh, the uh, supplemental spermidine would have those same effects. And in fact, one of the recent at least two of these clinical trials on spermidine uh, have found that, number one, the first study found that it didn't even raise blood spermine levels or spermidine levels, so it probably has, has little to no like, bioavailability. Or, and the second study also found that the spermidine supplements, they uh, didn't improve cognition in elderly people who suffer from like some, um, uh, let's say, decrease in cognitive function. So uh, at least right now, it kind of goes to show for me, at least, that there's no point in taking spermidine supplements. There's little to no evidence that they work. A lot of the review articles on spermidine being a longevity supplement are written by people who have, uh, let's say, uh, stocks in spermidine supplements or these companies. So I personally, I, per I don't want to waste money on this uh, spermidine supplement. And I did stop taking it, you know, over the last year and a half or something like that. I did take it initially just to try it out and experiment it. And uh, some people say that it helps with like hair growth or something that my wife also tried spermidine. And she said it did help with hair growth and nails, for example, but um, anything else I haven't, haven't noticed. And uh, the clinical trials, at least on spermidine right now, show that it does, ha it doesn't have any effects. So much rather than taking spermidine supplements, it's better to focus on the dietary spermidine, the spermidine that you get from foods like wheat germ, uh, cheeses, some beef even has vegetables, mushrooms, and natto. Those foods have uh, the most amount of spermidines. The highest spermidine food is like wheat germ, wheat bran. So you can just buy uh, powder of uh, wheat germ and it's actually tastes quite nice you can add it to salads or some in, mix into smoothies or just take it with a spoon you're going to get much more spermidine or mo more like bioavailable form of spermidine i guess and also like uh, that is aligned with the current studies that the dietary spermidine intake is linked to reduced mortality so i'm just fine by eating spermidine foods myself the second supplement I want to talk about that I stopped taking is calcium alpha ketoglutarate. So this is another uh, more trendy supplement or a supplement that is becoming trendy. And I do think that there are mechanistic reasons why calcium alpha ketoglutarate might have some health benefits. And uh, it has to do with the Krebs cycle, so energy production and uh, things like that the citric acid cycle. There's also one human study that found that supplementing with calcium alpha-ketoglutarate reduced biological age scores in humans. So this is one of the like the biggest reasons why people think that it's going to have longevity benefits. So it reduced the DNA methylation-based uh, biological age uh, in humans. And uh, that's only just one study, unfortunately. And it's obviously not enough for, for me to keep taking L calcium alpha ketoglutarate i did take it it's just very expensive so right now based on this one study it's not worth it for me at least to take it in uh, like a regular basis like in a few years or something we might have new studies that uh, either replicate those effects or you know shed new light onto the topic so then i might change my mind maybe it is worthwhile taking just right now you know there's a lot of supplements that initially are seen or thought to have a lot of benefits but after a few trials they like become disappointing uh, supplements so like spermidine for example i think it's a bit disappointing results as of now and you know who knows what's going to happen with calcium alpha ketoglutarate as well right now i'm not taking it because it's uh, pretty expensive next supplement on the list is torchesterone so <laughs> this is another hype supplement i guess over the past few years so um Torchesterone is an ectosterone, like a plant or like an insect steroid hormone 
that uh, supposedly helps with muscle growth and muscle hypertrophy. I've tried it. I haven't noticed like muscle growth, but I did notice that I was slightly stronger when I was taking uh, turgesterone. Maybe it's placebo, but um, I was already, when, while I was taking the turgesterone, I was already aware of the studies that find that turgesterone has no like uh, beneficial or like, it doesn't have any anything uh, greater effects for muscle growth and muscle strength than placebo, at least in the human tr uh, trials that we do have. So it's, you know, my mind was already prepared that, hey, it shouldn't work, but I s still noticed like a small increase in my strength, just the strength, the pure strength uh, component of my exercise routine. But uh, I didn't notice anything else. So uh, again, it's a bit more expensive and it's a very like theoretical or hypothetical supplement as of now so i'm not taking it because of that reason maybe if i really want to max out my strength gains in the short term then i might take it again but again maybe it's placebo so uh, i'm not gonna take it uh, right now and the last supplement that i'll cover is alpha gpc so this is a cholinergic supplement i do think that it's worthwhile to uh, make sure that you get adequate choline but in my opinion it's better to get the choline from dietary sources and again, the alpha GPC is, uh, it does have nootropic effects. I did notice that it helps my brain to work, <laughs> but, uh, I'm not in any need of using nootropics. I've never used any like actual smart drugs or any other serious nootropic agents in my life. I've never needed to do it. So I'm already pretty productive and mentally clear all the time without needing to take any nootropics. But yeah, alpha GPC, the choline, the aspect of uh, choline, um, is also important for like just neurodegeneration and preventing fatty liver but right now i'm getting enough dietary choline pretty regularly from like eggs is my main eggs are my main source of choline but i'm also eating less fat overall so my requirement for choline is significantly lower as well so if you eat a high fat diet then you need a lot more choline to pretty much help with the uh, fatty, fatty oxidation and to prevent the um fat accumulation in the liver so i don't need like large amounts of choline in my opinion like the more fat you consume apparently then uh, the more choline you also need and my liver fat values were fine my visceral fat is relatively low and uh, the amount of choline i'm getting from diet should like cover all the like the requirements for choline these are the supplements that I've stopped taking, but I'll also outline some of the red flag supplements that I think are actually potentially dangerous or harmful to uh, your health. So the first one that I'll mention is going to be Reservatol. So this one supplement is uh, another one of the most original longevity supplements thought to have longevity benefits. But uh, I think it's pretty clear that right now, at least, there's no indication that it's going to extend lifespan. Even in animal studies, like the National Institute of Aging study on resveratrol, didn't find life extension from resveratrol use. And the only, like, the only, I guess, reliable or the proven method where resveratrol, I don't want to say extends life, but enables the continuation of life is when you have these... Um, mice who are fed like a super obesogenic diet like 60 percent coconut diet and uh, in that scenario the resveratrol does make them live longer but uh, those mice already live shorter than the average healthy mice <laughs> so it's just that the obese mice might have some uh, they might gain some protective effects uh, from resveratrol if they're obese and if they're consuming like an obesogenic diet and in humans you find that in human uh, studies the resveratrol does improve blood sugar and lipids, but those people are also, you know, obese and with metabolic syndrome and other aspects of poor metabolic health. So in otherwise healthy people, there's no evidence that it's going to extend lifespan or or have any other health benefits really, unless you have like elevated lipids or elevated blood sugar. And it can actually do like more harm because resveratrol does reduce ea 2 max it can blunt some of the hypertrophy response from exercise and uh, it has also been found to reduce testosterone levels in men so i think it's a more net negative and uh, unless you are someone who has metabolic syndrome or obese or, or something like that then i don't think you have a lot of lot to gain from uh, resveratrol the next supplements that i want to cover are iron and calcium so both of these uh, supplements in uh, supplemental doses so larger doses are implicated in uh, myocardial infarction, heart disease, and atherosclerosis. So taking calcium supplements raises blood calcium levels too high and causes hypercalcemia, which then can, um, or it is associated pretty consistently 
with uh, strokes and uh, heart disease as well. Unless you have like super low calcium levels or if you don't consume any other form of dietary calcium, then uh, you probably are better off not using uh, calcium as a supplement. So maybe there are a few cases of, yeah, women who, postmenopausal women, if, if they have low calcium levels or if they consume low calcium diets, then in those cases it might be like you know worthwhile to consider but again you need to like measure your blood calcium levels you need to make sure that you're getting adequate dietary calcium and uh, that kind of thing so otherwise normal people i think it's actually more dangerous to use calcium as a supplement because of the studies associating with with uh, heart disease and iron like excess iron too high iron levels are also problematic excess iron can cause oxidative stress and and can lead to atherosclerosis the like associations with iron are less consistent as it is with uh, calcium but again like if you're a man especially then using iron as a supplement is a pretty bad idea in my opinion because your iron levels are generally higher as a man than it is in women and uh, it's harder to excrete iron like the only reliable method to excrete iron is through like menstruation or uh, blood donation uh, or other some form of other bleeding if you cut yourself in like a sword fight for example or a katana fight so you know it's as a man it's uh much healthier to prevent that you're not consuming too much iron than it is for women like women generally you know pre-menopausal women they're already getting rid of the iron every month if they're menstruating regularly um, and they are at a higher risk of iron deficiency but uh, supplementing iron for them could also be something that they need to first pay attention to like okay what's your iron levels are you anemic and are you getting any other symptoms so i wouldn't take these supplements just for the sake of it talk a lot about the longevity benefits of the sauna on this channel using the sauna over four times a week compared to two to three times is linked with a 63 percent lower risk of heart disease mortality 46 percent lower risk of hypertension and 40 percent reduced all-cause mortality it's also linked to a 65 percent lower risk of dementia and alzheimer's those are quite incredible numbers. In my opinion, using the sauna is the second most powerful thing after exercise for your longevity. The sauna actually mimics a lot of the benefits of exercise by giving you a mild cardiovascular workout, increasing body temperature, as well as making you excrete out microplastics, xenoestrogens, heavy metals, and the so-called forever chemicals. I'm from Estonia, so there's a lot of saunas everywhere. However, they're not that common in the US or UK. Fortunately, infrared sauna blankets are about 10 times cheaper than a regular sauna, and they give the same benefits in terms of sweating and the heat. I'm using the Bond Charge infrared sauna blanket almost every day. It heats up in less than 5 minutes to 70 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature used in studies, and it fits under my bed. The Bond Charge blankets are also low in EMF, so you're not exposed to any radiation. You can get a 15% discount by heading to bondcharge.com for slash seamlund and by using the code seam. All right, back to the video. All right, next question. At which body fat percentage would you stop a muscle gaining phase and start cutting? So this is an interesting question. For, for the sake of muscle growth, then while keeping in mind the idea of longevity and health, then I think it's not a smart idea to get fat when you're trying to gain muscle. <laughs> because first of all, if you gain too much body fat, then yeah, you're just gaining body fat and uh, the amount of muscle you still gain is a uh, minimum compared to like building muscle slower over time. So there's no real reason, in my opinion, to do this dirty bulking and to gain a lot of mass just for the sake of it. It's much better to yeah, focus on a slow, uh, moderate calorie surplus and uh, keep consistent with the resistance training to increase muscle through that means. So what's the best body fat percentage? to like maybe look at well i think uh, in my like i would never want to go above 15 percent body fat as a man and uh, for women like 25 percent so the uh, that's the kind of sweet spot like if you start to lose the abs if you see that you're getting a bit too fluffy like you can pinch the belly and stuff like that then that's already a sign okay maybe you're getting a bit too <laughs> too uh, chubby and it's better to kind of kind of um, lose some of that fat and then maybe regain some weight after uh, that but you know these much rather do instead of doing like this dirty bulking it's better to do like mini cuts mini bulks i'm a bigger fan of that i've never done like actual dirty bulking or any prolonged periods of bulking i've always done mini cuts mini bulks so to say like maybe two to three weeks of uh, cutting two to three weeks of bulking and that's how i've maintained a lean physique for the last 10 years while having gained uh, quite a lot of uh, muscle in the process as well 
and always maintained uh, the kind of uh, abs, visible abs, and uh, still made progress in the gym and still made gains in muscle growth. So there's no point in getting really fat because the the fatter you become, <laughs> then uh, the harder it's going to lose it. And also you're just not really building that much muscle in the process. So muscle growth is very slow compared to fat gain. So it's much easier to gain fat than to build muscle. So uh, with that in mind, you would just want to slow down this process, slow down the total gain of fat, and uh, then enable your body to catch up with the muscle growth, so to say. And uh, when it comes to longevity, then uh, it also is more important for men to be leaner than it is for women. Like you can find it pretty much across the board in most studies that that uh, if you want to, for a man at least, if you want to live longer and uh, you know reach centenarian food, for example, then you need to be pretty fit and healthy. Like you need to be actually significantly healthier and fitter than the average man or average person to become a centenarian. And all the centenarians the men who are centenarians, they're in pretty good health because to reach centenarianhood as a man, you need to be very healthy. And uh, being a lower body fat also uh, is a part of that. And uh, when you look at the studies comparing or assessing the relationship with, between mortality and body fat percentage, then with men, it's pretty much as low as the body fat percentage goes, the lower the risk. <laughs> so anything below 15% is linked to a lower risk of mortality. That's why I pointed out the 15% for me at least. Whereas with women, the relationship is less uh, linear. So for women, you can even have a body fat percentage of 30, 25, 20, up until like 35%. Uh, That's where you don't see any, in between those ranges, you don't see any increased risk as a woman. So uh, women, they can be not that healthy and not that fit and still make it to centenarianhood and still live pretty long, uh, which is kind of uh, interesting because, yeah, because of most of the centenarians, like the ratio is like eight to one or something, nine to one in some countries. So like eight centenarian women to one centenarian man. <laughs> so as a woman, it's it's uh, much less important to be lean and much less important to be fit and healthy to live long. But as a man, then you really need to be dialed in with your health and nutrition and exercise to live long. At least that's what is found pretty much uh, in many studies. And even among Olympic athletes, so one 2021 study found that Olympic athletes live on average five years longer than the average person. Uh, But uh, they found that the regular women who weren't athletes still lived slightly longer than Olympic men. (laughs) So even if you are an Olympic man, Olympic athlete as a man, your life expectancy is still lower than an average woman who doesn't do any exercise or who isn't an Olympic athlete. <laughs> of course, Olympic women, Olympic athletic women are with a higher life expectancy than regular women, but regular women are still with a higher life expectancy than Olympic athlete men, <laughs> which uh, just goes to show how how uh, strange it is, kind of. Uh, and you know, it might be might have to do with some of the sex hormones, might have to do with something else. Maybe risky behavior can mediate some of the effects. But uh, yeah, it's just uh, kind of uh, funny to see. Next question is: Whey isolate or concentrate better? So you might have seen on uh, whey protein powders, there's like whey isolate, whey concentrate. What's the different difference? So whey protein is um, pretty much extracted from milk. So they dry it up and they scoop the whey protein. And that's usually like 80% protein and 20% carbs or fats. And uh, they make the concentrate powder out of that. So the regular whey concentrate is about 80% protein and it has a higher fat and carbohydrate content. Whereas the whey isolate is that they extract it even more. So they remove even more of the fat and the carbs. So you'll end up with about like 90% protein, 10% carbs and fats. So the difference is that whey isolate is just higher in protein, usually lower in calories and lower in fats and carbs. But the difference is only like 20 calories per scoop, (laughs) something like that. So it's not a massive difference. But uh, there is a slight, you know, adjustment there. Which one is better? You know, I guess it depends on your budget and depends on your macros. So if you're with a lower budget, then the concentrate is fine. It's very good still. And whey protein is, you know, just the best protein powder in the world in terms of bioavailability and effects on muscle hypertrophy generally. And uh, whey isolate is just more maybe for like more professional athletes or professional bodybuilders who are really trying to count all their calories and macros and make sure that they don't get, you know, a too much 
fat or carbs. So it's, I guess it's for if you're with a higher protein intake and a lower fat and carb intake, then uh, it's easier to hit the macros with the whey isolate. Next question, glycine in the pre-workout drink. So uh, glycine, usually I like to take it before bed. So I'll take three grams before bed. That's amazing for sleep. I'll take three grams in my coffee or tea. And that's another way to make it kind of uh, taste better and uh, also helps with blood sugar response, for example, after meals. But uh, glycine before workouts is also actually a smart idea because uh, glycine lowers body temperature. And one of the limiting factors to your physical performance during exercise is uh, overheating. So maybe you, you, you might not notice it, but uh, the, uh, the bonking and your decrease in performance occurs when your muscles overheat and your body temperature rises too high. And there's different methods to uh, counteract that. Like you can, you can cool down your hands. You can wear these ice gloves or you can put your hands in a cold water or splash water on your head. That's why if you use like a cold towel like ice towel over your forehead that's going to cool down your body temperature and then enables you to exercise for longer but glycine also lowers your body temperature so uh, that's why for example if you consume some sort of pre-workout drink then adding glycine is actually a pretty good idea and of course just regular sodium has also been shown to uh, do that so sodium lowers your body temperature and uh, there's a lot of studies that higher salt solutions before exercise especially like longer endurance exercise increases performance uh, quite a lot and it's much more than any other like pre-workout supplement but that's for sodium so if you add glycine to your sodium mix then uh, that's going to have like additional benefits it's going to lower the body temperature as well and it actually improves sodium absorption so uh, that's all like a cool uh, workout hat hack that uh, you can use next question are there longevity benefits to donating blood so this is an interesting question because I just talked about if uh, men have high iron levels, then one of the best ways to lower that is through blood donation. So I do think that blood donation is probably healthy, like uh, a few times a year, uh, for unless you are anemic or something like that, then for the regular man at least, uh, non-menstruating woman maybe per- perhaps as well, then uh, for them it is, I think, a net positive to uh, dump some iron. Of course, you need to like measure iron as well to make sure that you're not becoming anemic in the process. But uh, blood donation also has some other interesting effects. So uh, recently there's been a lot of talk about these microplastics. Theoretically, yes, you can remove microplastics from your blood with blood donation, and, but there's also these uh, forever chemicals, PFAS, that have also been found in studies so like firefighters who are exposed to these different kinds of chemicals and toxins because of their work so they get blood donations and they can dump some of these forever chemicals with blood donation now if you go for like public blood donation then obviously if you donate blood then you're donating your microplastics (laughs) to someone else so i don't know if that's a like a very ethical way to do it but uh, i guess you could also just ask i mean there are probably ways to dump the blood or donate blood without actually donating it and uh, just you know th- throwing down the sink if that makes sense but again if someone is in life-threatening situations if you have a rare blood type so I have a rare blood type I'm um, zero negative so you know many people need it <laughs> and uh, it's much better to obviously get some of the the blood than to um, not uh, for someone who has some sort of life-threatening uh, situation next question is women's waist getting wider from lifting so i guess the question is like if you lift weights as a woman and you see is it possible that your waist circumference is going to rise so first of all it's for health purposes for men and women it's healthier to have the waist narrower than the hips so if your waist is bigger than your hips uh, then uh, that's a sign generally of visceral adiposity or just being too overweight So that is a risk factor for heart disease and it's linked to higher all-cause mortality as well. So pretty much getting your waist lower than your hip and getting it the waist-to-hip ratio as low as possible is generally associated with better health. And women do generally store more fat around the hips than the waist uh, unless they are accumulating visceral fat. So uh, if you're you're lifting weights and your body body fat percentage stays the same so you're still lean, you can, you know, you can see abs and stuff like that, and then your waist slightly increases a few inches, then it could be because, yeah, you're building core muscles. So if you're doing squats or deadlifts or just a lot of uh, core exercises, then theoretically your core will, you know, widen slightly, but it can't be 
it can't be like multiple inches or it can't be several centimeters. Um, you know, depends a lot on the person and their response to the training and their diet, etc. But e- even like the biggest like power lifters and just strength athletes who are doing a lot of core exercises, then even then they don't see their uh, waist exploding <laughs> unless they are gaining also body fat like power lifters or strong men do. But like bodybuilders, even though they're lifting heavy weights, their waist is still pretty narrow. Uh, unless they're taking growth hormone, which then creates the bubble bubble gut. But you know, you get my point that if your body fat is low and your waist slightly increases, then it's just maybe a little bit of muscle in there, in the core muscles. But if it's if it, if the waist increases and your body fat also increases and the waist is bigger than your hip circumference, then that could be a sign of either visceral fat or just being slightly you know overweight that um, you're maybe consuming too many calories. So there is a natural response by your waist becoming slightly, um, let's say, more muscle, muscular, but it shouldn't be too much. Like, I've lifted weights for over 10 years. I have a pretty thick core. Like, my core muscles are pretty good. And uh, my bone density and my spine density is also, like, super high because of doing squats and deadlifts. So I have, obviously, built a lot of thickness in, the, in my waist or my core muscles, but my waist is super slim kind of my waist is actually almost as as small as a like a woman's <laughs> but 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 that's because of my lower body fat percentage so my body fat percentage is so low that my waist is naturally or not naturally but my waist is just um, much smaller and my waist to hip ratio is also in the lowest risk category my waist to waist circumference is below the lowest risk category so it's even lower than what is associated with the lowest risk but that's because of my low body fat percentage and i still have muscle in my waist and uh, like a lot of core muscles, so to say. Next question, can we eat boiled egg as a pre-workout? So that's an interesting question. Uh, well, theoretically, yes. So eggs are generally pretty easy to digest and fast to absorb as well by available forms of protein. Boiled egg, so let's say one boiled egg has about 80 calories, 8 grams of protein, 4 grams of fat, approximately something like that. You know, how many eggs would you want to eat so at minimum, I think it depends on also like if you're doing training fasted or not. So if you've eaten anywhere, you know, four hours before the workout, then I don't think you need to eat anything. In that case, if you've eaten protein four hours before before the workout, then in my opinion, it's better to consume some like simple carbohydrates or fruit or something like that that's going to have a bigger performance enhancing effect than a boiled egg in that scenario because you've already eaten protein maybe a few hours before the workout if you're planning to work out fast that you haven't eaten anything you need okay i'm gonna need a quick snack then yeah like maybe do two to three eggs is a good idea for fast digestion and quick like bioavailability and then maybe adding a little bit of fruit there as well that would be like a pretty easy and uh, effective pre-workout snack but uh it wouldn't i wouldn't see any point in eating protein before the workout if you have already eaten like a few hours before that in that scenario i would do like more something fruit or berries or some some other like carbohydrates next question beef liver supplements for raising ferritin levels anything better for women again another iron question beef liver does contain iron in quite large amounts and it does contain copper as well which is more important for combating anemia and improving hemoglobin status so copper improves iron absorption and it also helps with hemoglobin production so i think yes like a liver supplement is probably better for iron and safer as well than an actual iron supplement so i don't think there's anything wrong with that and if you have low iron levels then yes i would start with probably you know eating liver perhaps and if that's not possible then the beef liver supplements as well and the final question is what would you do for gum disease so I am actually covering periodontal diseases, at least partly, in my new book, The Longevity Leap. And uh, the reason I did it was because there's a lot of, uh, let's say, connection between gum diseases, so inflammation in the mouth, and Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration, and and actually like gum inflammation, inflammation in mouth, poor and pathogenic bacteria in the mouth are linked to Alzheimer's. And they cause neuroinflammation because your teeth are an extension of your brain. They're part of your nervous system. So if the teeth are inflamed, they cause inflammation that spreads through the nervous system to the brain as well. 
and uh, the poor gut or poor uh, oral microbiome is also linked to uh, heart disease and uh, atherosclerosis so there is a very like interesting connection between these things so how do you like improve that or how what would you do well first of all it's important to just make sure that you're not doing the things that worsen your oral health and uh, increase the pathogenic bacteria things like smoking alcohol uh, this um, snooze the kind of a mouth tobacco those things are also are pretty problematic in that scenario causing inflammation in the mouth and the different kinds of sugary beverages added sugars in general like dietary added sugars and uh, just inflammation in general like if you have diabetes other medical problems visceral fat obesity they all all linked to poor oral health and in so doing you know neurodegeneration and uh, heart disease what would i do then well uh, after i've eliminated or tried to ex- exclude all of those factors then the second important thing is to just take care of your oral health but uh, you know if you have poor oral health as of now let's say you have gum inflammation then of course you need to clean your mouth regularly and you know at that point flossing is more important you know i do i think i do think that flossing is also worthwhile to do pretty much every day and uh, either using the tooth uh, floss uh, or the or there's also or there's also these uh, water picks that i've actually started to use that it's more convenient and faster way to floss so you're just uh, I guess shooting water with this uh, tube into you into these um, areas of the mouth or the teeth where, where the gums and the teeth meet and there that's a like a breeding ground for the bad bacteria so you can't really reach that with your regular toothbrush and it's harder to reach there with your floss as well although you can floss between the teeth but the water pick is pretty uh, effective way to like just flush water there and uh, kind of Uh, help to eliminate some of those uh, you know food particles and uh, some bad bacteria from those areas it's also interesting to find that there are these uh, different kind of essential oil mouthwashes and uh, like peppermint oil rosemary oil clove oil and even green tea has been found to improve the oral microbiome to help like fight these uh, bad bacteria and uh, periodontal uh, pathogens and bacteria in the mouth so uh, i would use some sort of mouthwash and essential oils oil pulling potentially as well with regular mouthwash the, the problem is that the regular mouthwash actually is also associated with slightly higher risk of di- diabetes and uh, neurodegeneration because of eliminating the good bacteria as well so regular mouthwash might you know wipe out bad bacteria but it also wipes out the good bacteria and it wipes wipes out the the uh, nitric oxide producing bacteria in the mouth so uh, nitric oxide it's this uh, molecule that improve, improves vasodilation improves blood flow and it also lowers the blood pressure now dietary nitrate is also linked to better health outcomes better oral health so things like different kinds of leafy greens beetroot spinach arugula and uh, those kind of things they're better for the microbiome as well other factors linked to a lower prevalence of gum disease include higher fiber intake higher omega-3 intake higher polyphenol intake low sugar intake and dietary carotenoids all right that's it for this q a check out my full supplement list in the description to know all the supplements that i take and which ones i don't take thanks for watching this video stay optimized stay empowered